And that's why I believe in you because that is the greatest purpose. It's to love. Honest. It's to, it sounds corny. Whatever you want to say, I don't care. I love people because there is freedom and power in loving people. Hello, all you positive heads out there. Thanks for tuning your beautiful brainwaves into another episode of the Positive Head Podcast, where we are firmly convinced that creating success and happiness is rooted in understanding the ultimate nature of reality and the fact that as human beings, we are all immensely powerful fractals of the one and only source consciousness, which creates and animates all things. Now, of course, understanding this powerful truth is one thing. Applying this incredibly empowering wisdom to everyday life, well, that's another, which is exactly why we provide you with a fresh serving of soul food for thought five days a week to help constantly remind you of what matters most. You are it. And I'm your host, Brandon Beecham. I'm the one who will be here with you each and every Wednesday interviewing a different consciousness change maker that is also out there working tirelessly to help catalyze change and expand awareness all across Spaceship Earth. On the other four weekdays, you can hear me discussing topics such as my favorite thought-provoking quotes, reading and discussing wisdom from empowering books, playing clips from various inspirational spiritual teachers, sharing a bit of mysterious news, taking questions from the audience, and essentially digging into any other mind-expansive topics that will help keep your soul fed by tuning you into positive vibrations on a consistent basis. And you guys have heard me say that if I ever run ads on this show, it will only be with a company that I fully support because I believe their intention is to make a positive difference in the world. Well, I'm pleased to announce that day has arrived and that this episode of the Positive Head podcast is being brought to you thanks to the support of Gaia. If you're not familiar, Gaia is the go-to source for streaming consciousness content online, and you can sign up for your first month for only 99 cents at Gaia.com forward slash positive head. That's spelled G-A-I-A dot com forward slash positive head. Check it out. All right, all you positive heads, on this week's interview episode, I am extremely excited because I have a guest that has been on my interview wish list since day one of launching this podcast, and that is none other than Dr. Bruce Lipton. Bruce is a stem cell biologist, 2009 winner of the Goy Peace Award, and the best-selling author of one of my favorite all-time books, The Biology of Belief. Hello, Bruce. Welcome to the show. Brandon, I am so excited to be here with you, giving some positive head as much as we can in all this stuff, <laughs> and, and, and really so excited because um, uh, I look forward to talking with your audience because I know that those people out there listening to you are are seeking answers and uh, looking outside the box, and that's where the answers are going to be found, so I'm glad to be here uh, to offer, I hope, some very interesting, empowering information. Oh, you definitely have some of that. So for me, I'm just trying to figure out what questions to ask and how much I can squeeze in. And yeah, the audience is uh, certainly the show is, you know, relatively new, about a year old, but grown rapidly and continued to continues to grow week over week. So I'm so grateful and appreciative for that. And, you know, bringing uh, information uh, like, uh, you know, from individuals like yourself is so key to sort of feeding the need or the the desire for more and more information out there. So thank you for doing what you do. And I'll jump right in and, and give you my first typical question I like to ask. You're in an elevator. You've got 10 floors to answer. The lady next to you looks over and says, ah, oh, what's your passion? What do you say? <laughs> first, I laugh. <laughs> yeah, of course, because you're trying to think how you fit it in in 10 floors, right? <laughs> and, and my passion is really, uh, I'm, I'm a biologist and understanding the nature of life and having found some what would be referred to as secrets and then realizing when I applied them to my life that uh, I, I, I've come to a conclusion that people think you die and go to your go to heaven. I, I've come to the conclusion that I think that we are in heaven right yeah. now. And this is where we can create everything you imagine. And uh, uh-huh. the new biology reveals the truth behind that. You know, I, I love that you say that because that's something that I reference often, oftentimes on the show. Not really, uh, I always would say, you know, sort of the standard. I'm not really religious, but spiritually minded and uh, very much into spirituality and, and think we have sort of the power in everything within us. And But there's one quote that I absolutely love from 
that Jesus, uh, you know, supposedly made in is, lest you become like a child, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. And I really love that because I feel like unless you get that exuberance, that childlike quality, he wasn't referring to some place that you go to when you die. It's it's now. It's you create it here. So instantly I, I really you make me think that. of that. You know, it's, it's very interesting. It's because um, um, having a, I, my science led me to some very interesting questions. And one of them was about spirituality because as a scientist, I wasn't a spiritual person. That wasn't my thing. I mean, I was teaching genes and, uh, you know, we're biological, right, right. you know, biochemical robots and all that. No absolutely desire or need to put spirituality in the equation. And science doesn't put it in there because it thinks it can, can it understands everything through the chemistry and all that. In my right. research, uh, uh, it, it led to the understanding that, oh, my God, uh, I, I'm not in here, <laughs> meaning my identity yeah. My identity right. is some information in the field picked up by antennas, a very special class of antennas on our cells called self-receptors. Now, self-receptors were given that name, uh, interestingly, not be, uh, not actually meaning what it really says, self-receivers, receivers of cell. Mm-hmm. Self-receptors are, are uh, protein antennas on the surface of the cell that distinguish one human from another, meaning why we can't exchange cells with each other is because no two people have the same set of self-receptors on their cells. So each human has a unique set. It's like a giant combination lock of antennas. And, wow. uh, and when they want to transplant an organ, uh, because the immune system will reject generally uh, uh, cells that are not self in that sense, in your body, if I transplant a foreign organ, your immune system will say, this is not me. It, it, it's so right. it will remove it. Uh, and so to transplant an organ, this is where the self-receptors came in, because they started to find out that if two people, because it's a large enough combination, you can overlap parts of the combination. So if two people share enough of the pieces, not the uh-huh. full complement, but enough, uh, the, uh, the the it reduces the aggression of the immune system. The closer they are, the less the immune system will be aggressive to it. And that's what they call tissue matching or typing. They're looking uh-huh. at these receptors on the surface. Well, the interesting thing about that in my research was, well, when I started to recognize that the cell membrane uh, was the brain of the cell and the surface Mm -hmm. uh, of the cell had these keys on it, like a a keyboard on a computer, but the keys are called receptors. So environmental signals are like fingers touching these receptors, the keyboard on the surface of the cell, and that sends information into the cell the, uh, about what the what's going on in the environment so that the cell can uh, ad- adjust its biology to meet the demands of what's going on in the environment. A cell needs to read the environment, simple as that. Right, and right. We all have the same receptors except for the unique set of self-receptors. And it's interesting because I said they distinguish the self. And here's a simple point. If I take your self-receptors, those antennas that distinguish you, off the surface of your cell, I take an enzyme and remove them, uh, the Mm -hmm. cell has no behavior. It has no behavior. It just sits there. And, And then when the receptors are reestablished by the synthesis inside the cell, and I make the new receptors and put it back on the surface... Then the cell has behavior. So the point is simply sort of like personality. Well, yeah, and what it's going to do, it's basically saying that a cell without any reading of the environment does nothing <laughs> because it has no mm-hmm. response to make. But the moment you have the receptors on there, then the cell responds to the signals of the environment right. and adjusts biology. And that's why the membrane is the brain because it reads the environment and then sends information into the cell about, listen, we have to you know, adjust our behavior from what I'm reading. So I say, yeah, well, we all have you know basic receptor sets that are the same for all humans, but the one unique set of receptors or the self receptors no two people have them and right. if i took my cells and put it into your body right now brandon your immune system will say not self and eliminate my cells and then i say wait what if i took my cells and removed just the self receptors uh, mm-hmm. off the surface the answer is then your cell uh, then when putting that uh, the my cells without my self receptors into your body uh, it's just called a human cell it doesn't have bruce's identity it's a human cell and your right. body will accept it because it's a human cell with no identity to it but it's a human cell wow Will it will it cause it to start working? Uh, you know, and, and sort oh, of uh, adapt. Oh yeah, uh, and, it, it will work wow. in the system because it won't be rejected by the system. It's not self. Interesting. So Interesting. it will participate and do all the things that cells do because there's a normal human cell. But then, then I say, wait, I take my self receptors off, and I if I could do this experiment, I, w- I let's say take your self receptors off of your cell and transfer them onto mine. 
So now mm-hmm. imagine I have my cells, so I remove my identity receptors, mm-hmm. so it has no identity. Then I take your self receptors, stick it on my cell. Number mm-hmm. one. Uh, if I put my own cell back in my body with your receptors, my immune system would reject it as not self. It would see it's, this isn't Bruce anymore, okay? And right, if I took right. my cell with your receptors and put it into your body, your system would say self. It wouldn't reject it because it recognizes self. Wow. So the self identity, the uniqueness comes through the antennas. Well, what's unique about it is... We, we have to understand the nature of how protein antennas, uh, how these things work, and they, they vibrate with in, in resonance harmony to vibrations in the field. So like tuning forks, if there's a vibration mm-hmm. of the same vibration, a tuning fork will pick it up and vibrate. So all of a sudden it says then you and I are expressed as receptors, but mm-hmm. recognize that the role of receptor is receiver. <laughs> I go, yeah, but right. what, what are these receiving? Well, they're receiving a signal of self. I go, yeah, but right. then where's the self? Well, by definition, it's not inside the cell. It's being something picked up by the cell. <laughs> and, right. and the moment I said, I, I saw that and I said, oh my God, I am not in this body I am right. a broadcast received by this body. And, right. and the first thing is my life profoundly, it was an instant transformation of my whole life because being a biologist, not being spiritual, is not relevant. I, I didn't even have the thought about it. But at this right. moment, I realized what? My identity, different than yours, Brandon, different than anybody mm-hmm. else out there, is because my cells are picking up a broadcast which is a unique vibrational frequency like a radio station. And so mm-hmm. uh, so like my body is like almost like a television set in a sense. It's I'm playing the yeah. Bruce show right now because right, right, I, right. I'm receiving the broadcast. And what's interesting, you say, all of a sudden it hit me at that one moment. I said, but wait, if I die, my cells are not there. They die. The broadcast is still there because the broadcast wasn't part of the cell. The broadcast was part right. of the field. The wow, broadcast yeah. is still on. And I say, just like a television set. I say, I'm watching a show. The television breaks. We say the show mm-hmm. is dead. And I go, yeah, the TV is dead. But what about the broadcast? You say, what? wait, you yep. can get another TV, plug it in, turn it yep. on, and tune it. Tune it to the station. And it's back yep. online. I go, oh, my God. If an <laughs> yeah. embryo shows up. In the future, with the same combination of receptors that are on my cells now, they mm-hmm. will pick up the same broadcast. And all of a sudden wow. it says, wait, because then my identity never died. It was always part of the broadcast. And it right. was like, oh, then I said, well, I can't die because I'm not even in here. <laughs> That's the first <laughs> right, thing. Right, right, right. <laughs> and then and, and it became very interesting because when all the data fits together, it makes so much more sense. And, and, and to simplify the story, because it's an interesting analogy, is this. Uh, we can't go to Mars, but I really want to know what would it be like to live on Mars? Well, you can yeah. see Mars in a telescope, but that's not even clear. How can I know what it's like to live on Mars? Sure. Oh, we send up the Mariner, the rover, the Mars rover. And I go, mm-hmm. well, what is that? And I say, well, that's the equivalent of a human. And you say, what is it? Mm-hmm. It doesn't look like a human. It looks like a fancy go-kart. I go, no, it's a human in this regard. It has cameras to see with. It's got sound mm-hmm. receptors to hear the sounds. It's got uh, temperature receptors to feel the temperatures. It's got samplers to see what the air is made out of and uh, the, what the soil is made out of. It's, it's got all these receptors on it to read the environment. And then I, So I say, how does it work? There's a guy at NASA. <laughs> mm-hmm. They send up this vehicle, <laughs> and there's an antenna on the vehicle that receives a broadcast from the guy at NASA. So the guy right. at NASA can drive the vehicle around on the surface of Mars. But right. what the vehicle, uh, while well, it's on the surface of Mars, recording all the data. And I said, right. what does that do? It goes back on the antenna to the source. So the guy at NASA has the experience of being on Mars. But it's a virtual right. experience in that sense, right? right. And right. And uh, and I say, yeah, and if the Mars rover battery goes, you say the rover is dead. And I say, but yeah, but that didn't kill the guy at NASA. <laughs> so yep. uh, the, the whole idea about that is they could send up another rover if it was interesting enough, set up a second rover. And I bet you it wouldn't be exactly the same as the first rover, but it could still have the same driver. And all right. of a sudden I, get, I said, oh, my God, put it into perspective. And I said, oh, 
We're Eureka. Earth rovers. <laughs> we're Earth rovers. Right. We we yeah. come to visit this planet, but we're not we're not physical. We are an energy yeah. and a virtual reality device called a biology suit. We get right. into the suit and we can see and we can smell and we can touch and we can have emotions and feelings. And I go, why is this relevant? Because my identity is coming in over these antennas, but my experiences are sent back to the source. So my right. life experiences, uh, and so as a scientist, of course, th- this all happened uh, from one moment when the moment I registered on me, oh my God, my, my self receptors are like a pin number to get into my computer on the cell. Oh, and I, right. that's when the whole thing unfolded. And so within about one minute, my whole life transformed because I really went from uh, not spiritual to say, oh my God, of course I'm spiritual because I'm an energy right. in the field I'm, uh, and I'm not right. going to die with this vehicle and all that. But it was kind of fun because at that very instant, uh, my scientific mind had a question. My scientific mind asked myself a question, a mm-hmm. self question. Why have a spirit and a body? Why not just be the spirit? Mm-hmm. And the answers welled up. 50 trillion cells, the voice of 50 trillion cells welled up into my head in the form of a question. I asked, why have a spirit and a body? And my body responded with this question I formed in my head. Uh, mm-hmm. This is fun. It was a fun answer. I said, why have mm-hmm. both? And my body said, Bruce, if you're just a spirit, what does chocolate taste like? <laughs> and all of a sudden I realized, oh my God, the biological body is a, a transducer, meaning uh. it takes the environment we live in and breaks it into images, colors. It breaks it into sensations and feelings and and uh, all these other things. And it's translated by the cells in, in the nervous system. See, so the nervous system picks up a vision of what I'm looking at. But in the brain, there's no photograph of anything. What is it? It's translated as vibration. I go, right. oh, so there's not a real picture. There's a vibration of a picture in the field right. i go and taste something i go well the chemical didn't go into your brain that you tasted it in your brain the nerves right. in your mouth translated it into vibrations and sent yeah. it to the brain all of our senses of reading the world are translated by the nervous system into vibrational signals Right. And, and it's all of a sudden said, oh, my God, because the, that's the communication that's sent back to source. And it's very interesting because, you know, we read people's brain activity by putting wires on their head. It's called EEG, electroencephalograph. And I can read your brain activity right. because the electrical activity of your brain is conducted via the skin like a, like a wire conductor. So I can read it on the surface of your skin. What's yeah. interesting is there's another way to read the brain, a more uh, more recent development. Instead of electroencephalograph, it's called magnetoencephalograph. It reads instead oh, of the wow. electrical charge, magnetic field. Most important point, the probe does not even touch the head. The probe is outside wow. the head. And I say, right. yeah, well, what's the meaning of that? The meaning is like, the meaning is simple. It says, your thoughts and your brain activity are not contained in your head. They're broadcast back into the field. Why? I can read them out in the field. I don't need to put the wire in your head. And all of a sudden, it's oh, my God. So we really are like Earth rovers. We get a chance to jump into this biological suit, and we drive this suit around on this planet. And as we learn, we interact with the planet, and we can create. Yeah, you can create any damn thing you want. That's what the nature of humans are all about. We're creative. And and it's like, oh. And I say, well, wait, so that my spirit doesn't have, my my spirit has an energy field, it's awareness, okay? But if I want to manifest an awareness, you know, let's say, oh, imagine, you know, heaven is this like South Sea Island beach with the palm trees and the breeze and the beautiful oh, right. blue water. I say, imagine all that. And I say, yeah, but if you come to earth, you can experience all that. But that means yep. if you get into the biological suit, you can experience what you want to create. And that goes back to your source. So it's a creating virtual reality. And I go, interesting. 
This is exactly, <laughs> exactly yeah. the understanding of the biology. Your identity is in the field. You get into the body. The body translates the field into all these different sensory uh, inputs to, to emotions even, love and things like that, are translated mm-hmm. into vibration. The vibration we now are aware of is not contained in your head. It goes back into the field. And it's like, oh, my God. This is heaven. <laughs> this is yes, exactly. where we came to create your vision, your wish, your desire. And right. then, of course, it looks like hell. And then you look like and say, Lipton, nice idea, but you're, listen, I didn't come here to live in hell. If it's heaven, then why am I not experiencing heaven? Why did I get <laughs> sick? Why is there war? Why is there uh, violence? Why are there crises, environmental, all these things like this? It's like, this doesn't look like heaven. I go, yeah. And now I got to hmm. tell you the answer, Brandon. I love it because most everybody's <laughs> out there seeing the movie called The Matrix. Right. Interesting right. story. You go in the video store, please, uh, where's the Matrix? Oh, it's over in science fiction. I go, no. Yeah. The Matrix yeah, I just, is a documentary. <laughs> right. I, I agree fully. My all time favorite movie, actually. So. And, and, and it's really interesting because uh, the, the Matrix is the story we've been programmed, which if we get into it, that's an absolute scientific fact. We have been programmed, very specifically the first seven years of our lives we've been programmed. Uh, and, and it's interesting because this is not new knowledge, uh, it, relatively new in science, but it's not new knowledge planetary-wise because think about this. The Jesuits have been boasting for 400 years Give me a child until it's seven, and I will show you the man. And right. People didn't understand. What the hell were they saying? It's, what does it mean? And it's actually the truth. The first seven years of your life is programming, and those programs then essentially control the rest of your life. So if I get the first seven years of programming, give me the child for the first seven years programming. Yeah. Yep. I will show you the man, meaning I will show you what that person will become because it will become what I programmed. And so the right. reality is, yes, that's absolutely now scientifically valid. We have been programmed. And in fact, interestingly, for the first seven years appears to be the right date. And uh, and that the movie The Matrix is right. We've all been programmed. But then the movie part of The Matrix that brings fun into the story now is, well, there was a chance to take two pills, the blue pill, where you take it and you wake up and you're back in The Matrix and life is just the way right. it always is. Or right. you take the red pill. And you get out of the program. And yeah. the interesting thing is it really didn't say, well, what would be the real consequence if you took the red pill? Now I can tell you, right. since the real, the real <clears throat> consequence is that we have been programmed, there is a real consequence of taking the red pill. And most yeah. everybody out there, if they're at least past teenage years, has taken the red pill, whether they knew it or not. And it profoundly yeah. changed their life at the moment they took the red pill. And they say, well, what was that? And I say, we now know that falling in love, at the very mm. beginning, that head over heels falling in love, is tantamount to taking the red pill. And I say, look, your life could, could suck all the way up until you meet this person. And then overnight, yeah. the next day, it's like, God, this is beautiful. Life is great. I'm so happy. I'm healthy. I'm energized. I'm in love. Right. Wow. Everything's great. And I go, it's the same world that was there yesterday. <laughs> yep. What's different about it today? And we now know that uh, biologically, uh, falling in love is, uh, uh, makes us uh, the um, uh, mindful. Uh, we can talk about that that but wrote it really this is your book there. right uh, your most recent book the honeymoon, honeymoon effect. effect you talk about yeah. this yeah yeah and, and basically what it says is it's the one time where we stay conscious and don't let uh the programs that we got mm-hmm. in the first seven years run the show and i say well what happens when you stop playing the programs that's the equivalent of red pill i go yeah when you fell in love at that moment you stop playing the program and say what was the consequence i go back and say the honeymoon i go that was that beautiful God, I love life moment. I go, yeah, yeah. And guess what? And that, uh, and the way you experience that was you stop playing the program. And once you start playing the program again, that's when the honeymoon ends. And all of a sudden, life becomes more regular again, uh, yeah. even though you were with your lover, uh, which when you first were with your lover, it was heaven on earth. And then it becomes more. Uh, and that's because there is some point where taking that red pill wears off. And then we go yeah. back to the program. And then all of a sudden, all that beautiful thing. And I said, but what was the difference? The answer was this. When you were free to create your life, 
without a program, you manifested heaven on earth, which is the yeah. destination. But once the program kicks back in, then here we are in this planet with all its crises. And it's like, yeah. whoa. So what do you do I to, what lot. do you do? I talked a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And in good for it too, because this is fascinating. So, so what do you do uh, to, uh, you know, and it's funny because everyone knows exactly what you're talking about when you say the honeymoon effect. You see, I just saw a meme the other day, you know, here's the first or video or something. It was like kind of showing the couple in the first month and it's this very passionate, romantic thing. Then it's like a year later and it's like the complete opposite. What do yeah. people do to sort of, uh, you know, continue in the state. What, I, I'm assuming this is something that you cover in your book. Okay, because oh, that's not one that let's, I've read let, yet. <laughs> let's start. Let's start with this very simple understanding. This, first of all, very important. The uh, truth in the phrase "knowledge is power." And, yeah. and now I want to <clears throat> emphasize uh, the same thing, but say in a different way. And that is, a lack of knowledge is a lack of power. Yeah. What's important about it is the knowledge that we're talking about right now is the knowledge of personal empowerment. And, yeah. and, and this is the really uh, important understanding because we have to say, well, wait, uh, uh, I, I'm this biological robot. Lipton said I was programmed for seven years. And, and what does that mean? And the answer is simply this. If you just think about, uh, well, number one, uh, analogy story. I go to the uh, Apple store. I buy a brand new iPod. I take it out of the box and push play, and nothing Mm -hmm. happens. And then a smart little five-year-old next to me says, well, jerk, you know, (laughs) old guy. (laughs) You didn't download anything in it, so it's not going to play anything. I go, okay, this is truth about the mind. Before you can use the conscious mind, which is the play button, the play button is the creative button. Make a playlist, select what you want, you know, do all this kind of stuff. That's consciousness is like the touch screen on front. But right. if you don't have any programs in the in the hard drive, then nothing's going to happen. Yeah. The conscious mind can only work once you have built-in understanding and programs in the subconscious mind. So it says before consciousness can be engaged, you have to have yeah. programs. I say, well, this is the first seven-year period of our life where our brain function is not operating at the EEG vibrational level of consciousness. It's a lower vibration called theta. Theta is imagination, and that's like, why, why kids under seven? easily mm-hmm. mix the imaginary world and the real world in a seamless way. So, if, for example, the mother wants the broom and she says to the kid, give me the broom back. And the kids say, no, this is a horse. Uh, it's riding the broom. <laughs> it's a horse. To the kid at that moment, it is not a broom. It is a right. horse. That's, that's imagination. That's theta, mixing imagination and reality. Okay, But more importantly, theta, which is the predominant uh, brain activity for the first seven years, uh, is also hypnosis. So the point is this. The first seven years, your conscious brain is not functioning at that level yet. We don't reach that as a predominant vibration consciousness. So the first seven years is a lower vibration more in theta, which is record. So it's like, oh, so the conscious mind's not on, but the, the, the brain is like a video recorder, camcorder. It's, it's, uh, it's recording everything it sees. And just recording, yeah. downloading a database, just downloading a database. I said, well, then how does it learn behavior? And I say, why is it important? Because to be a functional member of a family and a community, there are rules, not a few, thousands of rules. Right. I mean, think about, listen, how a father talks to his own child is different than how a father talks to somebody else's kid, which is different than how the father talks to the mother, which is different than how the father talks to the neighbor, which is different than how the father talks to the policeman. I go, oh, my yeah. God, uh, these are nuances of right. how you behave. And I said, well, how can you learn all these? And the answer is you can't teach it. It's not in a book. I said, yeah, but you learn it. I say, how? Brain's on hypnosis. The child just watches the father and downloads the behavior of every situation, learns how these situations are, becomes programs are automatic. That's called subconscious. Subconscious yeah. is downloaded programs, okay? Uh, and right. then when you're conscious... Uh, for the first time, you're old enough to put your hands on the wheel and drive the vehicle. That's what consciousness, drive the vehicle. Uh, and when we're riding with consciousness and we, our identity, our spirit, who we are, is actually has hands on the wheels and driving the vehicle toward a destination. And then I go, okay, here's the problem. Consciousness is, is like hands on the wheel, pilot, driver of the vehicle. And I say, mm-hmm. 
here's the unique aspect that is most important and also because we're unaware of it is the most powerful problem <laughs> and that is this the conscious mind the driver of the vehicle the conscious mind is not time bound it can go into the future and go into the past uh, you know i say uh, brendan what are you doing sunday at one o'clock if you're really going to answer the question the answer is not outside the answer is inside So your conscious mind, to seek an answer to that question, has to think. And by thinking, it means it goes inside. And then all of a sudden I say, yeah, but if you're driving the vehicle, like I'm walking down the street, uh, and I say, and and all of a sudden your conscious mind lets go of the wheel because it just went inside to get the answer to the question. Does the vehicle just stop? Does you just stand in place? I go, no, you keep walking. I go, well, how can you do that? I say, ah, because the subconscious, which knows how to walk and knows everything about walking and, you know, the stoplights, the signs and all that. Uh, recorded that over your learning period, uh, the moment you let go of the wheel, the subconscious is autopilot. It takes over. Yeah. Yeah, But when it takes over, it plays the programs that it downloaded because that's all it's got. Okay. So I say, well, great. I say, when we are conscious, we hold the wheel. We're driving the vehicle in a destination of conscious mind, which is creative wishes and desires. That's, uh, so I say, hey, Brandon, tell me what you want out of your life. That's a creative thought. That's why it yeah. comes from conscious mind. So I say, oh, so when conscious mind is driving, it can go toward wishes and desires. I say, absolutely. And I say, and then when conscious mind is thinking, the default is autopilot subconscious. And I go, yeah, yeah and, but the subconscious programs were acquired in the first seven years by observing others. So when you're engaging in subconscious, predominantly those behaviors are just repeating other people's behaviors, not yours. It doesn't have your yeah. wishes huh. and desires, so you're just doing behavior. So why is this relevant? And this is it. Uh, we now recognize that 95% of the day, probably as a minimum for most, uh, the conscious mind is in thought. I go, what does that mean? I said, well, that means simply 5% of the day you have the hands on the wheel and you're driving towards right. your wishes and desires. And 95% of the day you're in thought, autopilot, subconscious is running the show. But the programs in the subconscious came from other people. So they're not running your life in the direction you wanted to run in. It's running it in the life of the direction of other people. You're right. expressing other people's behavior. And then you say, but I should be able to see that, especially since 70% or more of that behavior that is downloaded in the first seven years is disempowering, self-sabotaging, and limiting programs that limit and disempower us. And I go, yeah. Jesus, that's 70% of the programming we got. And I go, well, what's relevant? Well, it's playing 95% of the day. I say, then yeah. I'm disempowering myself or I'm sabotaging myself. You say, well, I, I should observe that and I would know better. And I go, ah, no, you're in thought. Thought, you're inside your head. You're answering, what am I doing on Saturday? <laughs> and while you're thinking about that, your behavior is expressing itself outwards and you don't see it. Point, you don't yeah. see your own behavior 95% of the time. Wow. In my lectures, I give the same story uh, to each lecture be, uh, in each lecture because it, it, it crosses everybody's experience. And I go, I'm sure uh, that you had a friend and you knew your friend's behavior very, very well. And you happen to know your friend's parent. And one day you recognize your friend has the same exact behavior as their parent. And this is sort of amusing. So you offer something like, hey, Bill, you're just like your dad. And then you back away from Bill because Bill goes totally <laughs> ballistic. How, how can you compare <laughs> me to my dad? Oh, you're laughing already. So you obviously have awareness of this. Well, let me explain why that is, of all the things we talked about, why this is perhaps the most profound story right at this moment right here. And that is this. Everybody else can see that Bill behaves like his dad. The only one who doesn't see it is Bill. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's simple to understand. Yeah, 95% of the day, Bill is thinking, and he's playing the programs in his subconscious, which he downloaded by observing his father. And because he's thinking, he's the one that doesn't see it. So everybody else can see his behavior sabotaging him. He's the one that doesn't see it. I go, yeah, Yeah. and that's uh, uh, and the profound nature of that story. And here it is. Everybody, hold on. We (laughs) are we are all Bill. Every one of us, every yeah. one of us has been programmed for the first seven years, as the Jesuits had already noted, and that 95% of the day we will play those programs so we will manifest our life in alignment with those programs. As the story says, give me the child for the first seven years, I will show you the man. Those programs are running us, and as uh, science has revealed, most of them are negative and disempowering, and because you can't see it, what does that lead us to? And here's the conclusion. 
we personally wake up in the morning with wishes and desires. Today's the day I'm going to find love, health, happiness, whatever you look at. I'm going for it. That's 5%, part of your 5%. You're thinking about right. your wishes and desires. And I say, okay, then you start to live your life. And then 95% of the day, you're in thought. And I go, and what's happening? Well, you're now playing programs from the auto, auto you know, pilot base. Mm -hmm. And most of these programs are negative. And because you're in thought, you don't see them. And therefore, your wishes and desires destination, conscious mind, is not expressed. As a matter yeah. of fact, you could be shooting yourself in the foot every minute of that 95% of the day. I go, why is it right? Because I say, I started the day with great intentions. <laughs> and I come home at the end <laughs> of the night, tail between my legs, whimpering, going, oh my God, another hard day. It didn't work out. I didn't get any of my wishes and desires. And therefore, and this is where the problem comes in. And therefore, I'm a victim of fate, nature, life, mm -hmm. whatever it is, mm -hmm. is because I wanted this and look what I end up with. And who the hell shot me in the foot? Look at this bloody foot. And, and huh. the reality was you've been shooting yourself in the foot all day long, but 95% of the time you didn't see it. And therefore we think we are victims and not being able to express that heaven on earth. And I go, yeah. no, you are creating <laughs> through your programming right. hell because it's part of the creation you could create hell or heaven whichever one but if your program yeah. takes you toward hell then unconsciously you will manifest hell every day and then guess what that day you fall in love and i go well what's unique about that because science has now found the one time in your life where you are unconsciously mindful meaning because yeah. you found this individual, you're so excited, you've been looking for this individual and desiring this experience your whole life. Why would you spend yeah. your time thinking when you could have it because it's right there? So guess what? You live mindful. You're not using the thinking. And I say, oh, so mm -hmm. when you first fall in love, it's like taking the red pill. Why? Because you are being mindful, meaning you're not defaulting to the program, meaning you're not playing the program. You took love, yeah. the red pill. And I said, and what was the consequence of not playing that program? I said, your wishes and desires were manifesting. And I right. go, wow, it is true. It was heaven on earth. And then I say, yeah, but it disappeared. And I go, yeah, because no matter if you're in love, there's still a period of time where, you know, real life has to intervene again. <laughs> you have a right. job, you have chores, you got things you got to do. I say, the moment they start to take priority in your life, then more thinking goes toward them. I say, oh, now you're thinking. And I say, then what happens? So, well, the moment you're mm, thinking, default. you no longer are, are operating from wishes and desires. Now you're default to the program with those negative yeah. programs in it. And I say, what's the consequence of that? And I say, like Bill, you're playing these programs. You don't see it, but your partner does. And I yeah. say, what's the consequence of that? And your partner's looking at you going, who are you when you start playing some of these programs? And you're like, yeah. I don't even know what she's talking about. Why? Right. Because you didn't even see what you just did because that was part of autopilot. And now you're being called on it. Your conscious mind is searching around going, what the hell did I do? <laughs> and, yeah. and not realizing you have sabotaged this because the more you are thinking, the more you're bringing in negative programs back into a relationship. Remember the honeymoon did not have any of those behaviors in it because you were not playing programs. And so your yeah. honeymoon is based on who you really are and you lose the honeymoon as you go into thinking and your subconscious programs become the default driver. And all of a sudden these negative things happen, which are, is invisible to you. So you're always at a loss. As, I don't understand what the hell happened here. And the reason is because, well, you didn't see 95% of what happened. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's it. So when people understand this, then the, the whole issue is this. Wait a minute. If my subconscious programs so the negative things that are interfering with it, can I reprogram the subconscious? And of course, this is the best part of the, the conversation or one-sided dialogue that I keep talking over you. <laughs> uh, no, this please, becomes, uh, please. This is the important part because it simply is you can reprogram the subconscious. And all mm -hmm. of a sudden I said, well, wait, if I can reprogram the subconscious, then I can take any of the negative programs that have taken me downhill and rewrite them as positive programs that take me uphill. And then guess what? Even if I'm not paying attention, 
My subconscious mm-hmm. programs now are enhancing my life rather than taking them away, which they were doing before. And in fact, if I can make my subconscious programs match my wishes and desires that my conscious yeah. mind has of heaven on earth, and I put those programs into the subconscious, then guess what? I'm living heaven on earth whether I'm paying attention or I'm not paying attention because both minds are in harmony in regard to driving the vehicle at this time. And that is the secret of how to create heaven on earth. It's a technique that you have to learn because um, uh, uh, the bigger problem is, let's go, let's put the problems in perspective. The first problem is this. I believe I'm a victim, A, of my genes, which control my life, which we now know that's not true because the new science epigenetics says, no, your mind is controlling that. Then I say, yeah, but my mind is operating on on programs that I'm not controlling, and it's invisible to me. Therefore, I have been sabotaging myself without even knowing I was participating, so I was blind to it. Uh, and, And now C is, but with knowledge... I can reprogram the subconscious and put it in the program I want rather than the one society built into me. And I am free from the societal norms. I am free to have a honeymoon every minute of every glorious day on this planet. And, And this is like, that's the secret. What's the secret? (laughs) <laughs> the secret is uh, you have been programmed and you didn't do it. You didn't do the program. Yeah. But given the opportunity to program it, you can have a complete radical change of life. You can come back from death of cancer. You could be on the last stages of cancer You're on a machine operating you, change your mind, and then within days the cancer disappears. And, right. uh, and I love it because one of the stories that is highly documented about all this is a friend of mine, Anita Morjani, and she wrote a book called Dying to Be Me. And she's one who was four years cancer on machines in the last week of her life and uh, functions of the body had begun to shut down already. She was so emaciated that cancer lumps were sticking out from under her skin. You could see them. And she had an out-of-body experience. And in that out-of-body experience came to the realization that her life issues were conflicts due to her programming and her desires for life. They conflicted with each other. And so in seeking her desires, it really upset the programming. And the disharmony that resulted from that was expressed as cancer. She resolved this understanding in this out-of-body time to say, oh, my God, it's my belief system got back into the body and within uh, days uh, the cancer was gone and, wow uh, and it's basically saying yeah because she realized it was her mind and the disharmony that resulted in the illness resolving the disharmony resolved that that thing harmony returned to the system and she came back in full health Wow. Would you say that resistance to what is is one of the cause? And then, uh, like, okay, how do you keep the honeymoon effect? Like, what is the technique? Would it be learning to love, fall in love with the moment, each and every moment? To keep it is this. First question, why'd you lose it? And the answer is Mm -hmm. because I returned to the programs. I say, oh, right. But what if you rewrote the program so that when you return to the program, it's not the negative one that was causing the problem, but has been rewritten in a positive form so that when Mm -hmm. I play the program, it enhances my life rather than taking away from it. And the answer is this. Oh, well, great. Because the only reason I had that heaven on earth experience is because I stopped playing the programs. And if I change the programs to match the wishes and desires, then you don't even have to be mindful. As I said, you can still be thinking, but guess what? Your behavior will still be uh, a honeymoon behavior and encourage that. So you would be on a honeymoon 100% of the time, whether you're thinking or you're running on autopilot, Mm -hmm. it would still be the exact same. So what are the recommended techniques that you give for uh, going and uh, changing the programs? Well, the first thing is to recognize, very importantly, uh, the big error, because we see the mind as a single entity, and I'm saying, no, the mind is actually two separate entities, two different functions, and each mind learns in a different way. And that has, because when you put them together and clump them in there, you say, well, uh, uh, my mind just learned something really cool, but my life is still exactly the same thing. It's like, yeah, because your conscious mind may have learned something, but it didn't translate into subconscious habit. Right. Ah. And I go, okay, so what's the difference? Conscious mind is creative, hands on the wheel, 
your spirit uh, wishes and desires are driving the vehicle and it's a creative mind and that's the one that allows us to think into the future uh, and see what we want and have a destination and create that love that you want that first you create it in your mind and then your biology will seek it and, and I go okay that's the, the conscious mind that's doing that and then I go yeah but 95% of your life is not coming it's coming from the habit mind versus the creative mind subconscious is primarily right. habit I go, well, the issue then is uh, your life, uh, um, if you stay in the conscious mind, by definition, is, is totally creative, and that's how you can manifest the honeymoon in heaven on earth. Uh, and, uh, but the moment you default to the subconscious, you start playing these other programs, and it's not in your visible realm. And I go, okay, then two functions, conscious mind creative, subconscious mind habitual, mm-hmm. learning, learning, ah, the character of creative conscious mind facilitates learning. If I'm creative, I can listen to this podcast. I can, you know, mm-hmm. watch a video lecture. I can go to a lecture. I could read a self-help book. Uh, I could just go, aha, I got an idea. And the conscious mind will accept this and become part of the program. So I say, yeah, you could read a self-help book. I give you a test and you get 100% on the test saying, yes, I got every understanding out of that self-help book. And then I say, well, has your life changed? You go, no, it hasn't changed. I go, yes, reason. The kind of education you just gave was easily accessible to the conscious mind, but there's no way learned by the subconscious because that's not how the subconscious mind learns. Yeah, do you have to time travel back to the first seven years? <laughs> no, this is the cool part because the idea was this, uh, and that is the most uh, one of the more important questions, Brandon. Is well, uh, since most of the programming occurred, uh, you know, like in the last trimester of pregnancy, in the first seven years, especially zero, one, two, and three. And I, I say, can you consciously go back and get uh, tell me what the program is? And the answer: Well, no. Three, basically, your consciousness, as I said, wasn't even engaged until around seven. So I go, yeah. okay, uh, how do I? I know what the programs are because they're interfering in my life. And I go, this is the fun part. I love fun parts because it's the easy part. It goes <laughs> like this. 95% of your life is coming from the subconscious autopilot. Simple point. Your life is essentially a printout of your subconscious programs. That's simple. Right. You look at your yeah. life, and I'll just tell you how easily it is. You look at your life, and the first thing is you say, anything you like that comes into your life, comes into your life because you have a program that accepts them coming into your life then i go and in contrast anything that you want but you have to work hard at it struggle over sweat over put a lot of effort into making it happen Mm -hmm. why are you working so hard and the answer inevitably is your subconscious program doesn't support that and that's why you're working on it so I go, oh, well, yeah. good. I don't need to go back and find out who did what, the who, and you know the entanglement of growing up. I'd screw that. That's not relevant. I just need to know how yeah. am I responding, and the answer is, well, look at your life. So I say I'm having a problem uh, w- with relationships or something like that, and I go, oh, good. You know, My job issue? I have a problem with that one. It's the relationship. So I say, oh, well, then I need to understand what beliefs about relationship that my subconscious has that's sabotaging me because 95% of the day, apparently, I keep pushing away a relationship but i don't see it Uh, Mm -hmm. but at least you know where the problem is it's in relationships so you make some uh uh, you know statements about relationship and then you can do uh muscle testing which is a very interesting and very Mm -hmm. important way of dealing with the subconscious And, and the reason is this because there's another issue of subconscious which creates a problem and that is People sometimes say, well, I'm not a good talking to. (laughs) I'm going to straighten that out right now. I'm going to talk to myself and say, don't do this again. Don't do that again. I go, well, this is a great, you know, a noble plan. My question is this. um, Who are you talking to? And I go, oh, my conscious mind is trying to tell my subconscious mind not to play the program. I go, no, there's only one problem. There's no entity in the subconscious mind. It is as cold and hard as a video camcorder. <laughs> There's a machine. Mm, right. I go, why is it relevant? Because you keep talking to the machine as if the machine is going to make a decision and change. I go, no, there's nobody there to hear what you're talking about. It's the same as, you know, put a CD in the player and the program's coming. And then I say, oh, you don't like the program? Then talk to the CD player for a while and see if it will change the program. And the answer is no. <laughs> There's nothing right. to make a response. I go, the subconscious right. mind is a player. There's nobody in there. So trying to talk to yourself, that's not how you learn anything. I said, well, then simply this, how does the subconscious learn? Because if you learn in that way, then you can change the program. I go, 
number one. The first seven years it learned because the mind was in a very low vibration called theta, which is just the state of falling asleep at night. Yeah. Your vibration, your brain reduces the vibration, which is energy work. <clears throat> it gets just at the moment you become just about like unconscious in the sense that you're just going into sleep. That's the switch over from alpha consciousness mm-hmm. into uh, sleeping uh, is then you go into theta. So it says every night, just as you're going to bed, you happen to go through a period of theta. I go, oh, yeah. well, that's a record period. That's how I learn things. And I say, good. You you get a self-help CD, uh, <clears throat> put your phones on, and at night, put the earphones on as you're going to bed. And guess yeah. what? As you transition from consciousness into sleep, that's when theta is engaged. And if the earphones are giving you positive programs to affect your life, then these programs are not affecting your conscious mind. Your conscious mind's sleeping. It's now yeah. playing directly into the subconscious. Theta is recording it. So I, right. you can uh, self-hypnotize uh, in that way by putting on uh, earphones at night. So you can change the, 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 the program to change it to anything you want. Health, relationships, jobs, I don't care, whatever. Those are programs. <clears throat> so yeah. number one, hypnosis, self-hypnosis uh, is yeah. a way of changing the program. Number two, well, self-hypnosis ends by age seven. That's when consciousness kicks in, but you still learn things. You learned how to yeah. drive a car. That was yeah. long after you were seven. I say you can yeah. drive a car without thinking about it because you can have a conversation with a passenger, get so involved with conversation that you look out the window and realize you haven't even looked at the road for the last 10 minutes and you're still no, yeah. driving. And I go, yeah, because conscious mind busy in conversation, subconscious autopilot drives a car. No problem. So yeah. uh, the issue about that is, so how did I learn anything after age seven? I say, oh, repetition practice Hmm. anything you wanted to do you want to ride a bicycle get on the damn bike and practice every day you want to learn abcs repeat abc and every time as far as you can to the next letter learn the next letter repeat it again and go to the next stop until you don't what got through a to z and now guess what now that you got it you don't need to repeat it anymore so how did i learn how to drive the car do the abcs ride the bicycle do the job repetition do you want to change yeah. behavior? Create a new behavior and practice it as a, like a religious exercise. It's not just think about it. That was nice. I say, no, do it <laughs> because yeah. the system learns from practice. Uh, and, and it's interesting because what you're practicing is something that's not even in your life. And so therefore, sometimes it seems absurd. Like you're, you're sick with cancer and you're practicing, I am healthy and I control my life and I control my health. And it's like, yeah, right. <laughs> I got cancer. Yeah. So, no, no. Right. Keep repeating that because it has to learn that and once it becomes a program that i am healthy and i control my life then the brain's function is to take the program and make it real and that's why how you can replace you know you know reverse a a health issue is by reversing the belief about it Uh, and, and then all of a sudden the new belief releases releases new chemistry the mind causes the brain to release chemistry of healing rather than the chemicals that led to the disease because our mind is creating it so basically yeah. it, it says this put in a new belief program exercise it it is not a this is not a sticky note on the refrigerator i, I refer to those as wishes <laughs> wishes because every now and then you look at it and go oh yeah that's right nice and i go no no i'm talking about an exercise that repeats why because the subconscious mind is a habit mind when you are yeah. creating a pattern and you keep repeating it consciously and repeating it consciously and repeating it at some point the subconscious learns and then it becomes what do they a say habit. 21 days don't they say 21 days is sort of a key moment of any sort of uh, forming a habit well uh, that, that they say that and then it becomes true <laughs> yeah right <laughs> exactly it, it the biology faster? of belief yeah. right <laughs> can it happen faster yeah but if you make 21 days then then do yep. it 21 days because then it will work because that's what you believe so do it that way it's cool yep. uh, and then now i have to say but there's an exciting thing uh, a new understanding and and i relate this to an understanding that necessity 
is the mother of invention. And yeah. what I'm talking about in regard to necessity is this. The planet is in an extreme crisis right now that we're actually going extinct. Human behavior is destroying the ecosystem, which is undermining the web of life. And unfortunately, people don't realize we are the web of life. When you undermine the web of life, you've undermined humans. So uh, not only are we destroying all the other species, but humans are uh, facing extinction. And this is not like a thousand years from now. This is within like a hundred years from now and it's human behavior and the relevance yeah. is we must change our behavior as fast as we be, we can to evolve we we're hitting the wall when you hit the wall you have to change something and what yeah. science has revealed that the behavior we exercise in the world right now is the cause of the problem so obviously the solution to the problem at some point is to change the behavior and then i go yeah and i say yeah but the behaviors are 95 percent from the subconscious and so guess what we're introduced to a a new uh, modality called energy psychology. There are a number mm -hmm. of, of, uh, of modalities that express energy psychology. And on my website, which is very simple, brucelipton.com, under resource, mm -hmm. I list about 20 or so ways, uh, different different ways of changing subconscious programming using energy psychology. And I say, well, what's energy psychology have to do with it? And I say, it's a way of engaging something called super learning. You go, what's super learning? Well, maybe you've seen somebody use super learning. Um, uh, you ever see anybody in a bookstore pick up a book and move their finger down the page as fast as they stroke the finger down the page is as fast as they read the page. So they're sitting in the bookstore or standing in the bookstore, flipping the pages, moving the finger down, reading. They could read the book in 10, 15 yeah. minutes, you know, just by flipping the pages. That's called super learning. You're reading every word on the page by just moving your finger down the page. Uh, yeah. And I go, yeah, well, if you can engage that process, then you can also use that to reprogram. And so right. the energy psychology modalities, most of them engage a concept of super learning, which means, and here's the, okay, finally, what the hell is the good news in all this? And the answer is, <laughs> yes, uh, hypnosis takes a period of time. Putting in a, a repetition to create a habit takes a period of time. And the new energy psychology modalities can actually rewrite programs in the mind in about five to ten minutes. Once you may wow. have 50 years in your life, you can rewrite them if you know how to push the record button. And that's always been the problem. We didn't know how yeah. to engage the record button. Well, these energy psychology modalities engage them, most of them involving uh, integrating right and left hemispheres so they work in synchrony with each other, which is the way they were before age seven. Right and left hemispheres were working in harmony. Think about it. A three-year-old child in a family that has three different languages can pick mm -hmm. up each language and, and have them as separate entities with grammar and vocabulary and all that as three years old. I go, and I say, how about trying to teach a 10-year-old or an 11-year-old one new language? And all of a sudden, it's like, well, now it's difficult. I said, well, hey, when they were three, they could learn three languages easily. Right, you know? right, right. And what's different? The answer is before we were seven, the brain was primarily in sync, meaning right and left hemispheres were synchronized, working in harmony with each other. Uh, and each hemisphere has different qualities and characteristics. One way of looking at it, and there are many, one way is to look at the left brain as logic and the right brain as emotion. I say, and yeah. before age seven, logic and emotion were connected and working in harmony with each other. After age seven, it's called brain dominance. That during the day, sometimes you're operating from the right and like a wave, sometimes you're at the right and then the wave goes down. Now you're operating in the left hemisphere and then it goes back up and now you're up at the right. And so sometimes during the day, we're more logical in the way we see life. And sometimes during the day, we're more emotional in responding to life. And I say, yeah, but as long as the two hemispheres are not in sync, that fast learning process isn't occurring. And so mm -hmm. these energy modalities, many of them synchronize right and left hemispheres, which in the process of synchronization, a uh, hemisync, they call it. Uh, like binaural beats? Yes, exactly. And this mm -hmm. opens up the window for super learning so that you can take a new belief and download it in five or six or seven minutes. And just before we close out on this, just to emphasize, this sounds very new agey. And I go, well, it sounds new agey. And for a long time to me, it was kind of new agey as a scientist because it's like, well, I could experience that it worked, but I couldn't give you any insight scientifically that anything was, well, how did it work or what was going on? Uh, a, a friend of mine who I met uh, uh, 
after he experienced this and, and we got together, his name is Jeff Fannin. He's a neuroscientist and he does something called brain mapping, which is like 3D reconstruction of brain function uh, in different regions of the brain using EEG wires on the head and then the computer reconstructing it to give an image of how the brain is functioning, a mapping. Uh, mm-hmm. One of the people in his lab uh, went to uh, one of these uh, belief change modalities, the one that I'm familiar with called Psych K, uh, uh-huh. and learned how to change the belief systems and came back to the lab and told Jeff, yeah, well, I learned this technique about how you can change belief systems in five or six, seven minutes. He said, that's not possible. I'm a neuroscientist. I do brain mapping for a living. We didn't, there is no, this yeah. does not occur. He didn't believe it. And then yeah. the obvious thing was, well, wait, we're in a laboratory where we do brain mapping. <laughs> so uh, Jeff said, okay, here, I'll put the wires in my own head, and then you do one of these belief change modality things, and, uh, you know, let me experience it. And uh, he put the wires on his own head, and about six or seven minutes into the process, his whole world changed, his career changed, everything turned upside down because wow. he saw what was not possible on the EEG, a radical change in the in the readout of the EEG radical it was a whole, uh, you know, change in brain function. It was creating what they call whole brain function where all of a sudden all these parts were integrating in a whole new level with a new wow. understanding and new power. He only saw that once on some uh, uh, master uh, um, meditator, you know, person who, you know, like a, a, a monk, uh, you know, a Buddhist monk, uh, somebody. It, the only time he ever saw activity like that, uh, but he saw that it can happen. It, it's so obvious. This is the fun part. It's so obvious that he has also taken the uh, EEG device into a lecture hall and and had you know a volunteer come up. Uh, who wanted to change belief. They put the wires on their head and above the the person on the screen is the projection of the EEG live, live EEG. And they go Mm -hmm. through the balance on the stage. And the thing is, the change is so radical that even a non-trained person in the audience looks up at the screen and goes, oh my God, the thing just changed. And, And they can see it even before the person acknowledges that they experienced the change. Uh, the wow. audience could see when it happened. So wh- I'm, the reason why I go into the story, forget mm-hmm. the concept that this is all new age. There is scientific data to show that these things, these processes can change brain function in minutes. And this is what we need to do. Get our power back. And then just the you know simple review is look at your life. Your life is a printout of your program. What's not working means you have a program that doesn't support what you want. And then what you do yeah. is turn what you want into a belief statement and in one of these modalities, in five or six or seven minutes, you can download a new belief, which then, because the, the mind's function is to take a belief and turn it into reality. And that's why our lives are so every day. Yeah, this is just the way life is. It's like, yeah, because your mind is creating reality out of the program. And it's like every day. Yes, this is the way it is. Uh, and so by changing the program, we change the reality. And, and that Beautiful. is the whole secret. And that is our evolution. At this time, it's necessary for humans to change the way they're living on this planet because it's not just self-destructive of us and our own health, which is a health crisis, but it's destructive of the ecosystem, the environment, which provides for us and therefore threatening to us. And this is why evolution is happening. This, what's happening, you see the bad news. Uh, of the crises and the news and the radio and TV or whatever you you get your information and I go but it, realize this the good news is in the bad news meaning right. yeah I see all the bad news I see all the crises so what the heck is the good news and the good news is you can't continue doing this anymore it's time for us as a, a civilization to change how we live on this planet and what's beautiful about it is the new science of how you can program your life offers the opportunity. Yes. What if we all chose to live heaven on earth? What if we all chose to be in love right now? And the answer is then the entire planet would manifest that. And right. that, that's on the future. And, I, and your program uh, is really critical, Brandon, because uh, in this particular program, uh, the, the listeners are, are looking at how do I empower myself? And this right. is it. There is a way. Yep. And I love it because then all of a sudden it's no mystery. It's something we can do. Yeah. Yeah. And and the more people that do it, it's sort of like the hundredth monkey principle, I believe, you know, where uh, the more people that do it, the more, of course, we're all 
connected to the same collective consciousness and the more we're affecting not only our own world, but the, those around us because of the interconnection of it all. Yeah, and that's right. I mean, that's the difference between EEG, which measures your brain function by touching wires on your skin, and magnetoencephalograph, which reads your brain function at a distance. What's the point? Each one of us is a tuning fork, and our thoughts right. are going into the field. And if we start to make our thoughts in harmony versus disharmony, then collectively, yeah. every person who joins in with this positive thought is amplifying the field to the extent that even those that are not interested in going to the field will become entrained, they call it, entrained because the volume of the positive vibe will will bring them uh, uh, and train them to to conform to that. So it's like 100th monkey for sure. That's it. All right. Well, now seems like a good moment to take a quick minute to tell those of you who aren't familiar a bit about our sponsor, Gaia. I've been a big fan of Gaia for many, many years now, which is why they are the only content provider I've ever reached out to in regards to potentially supporting the Positive Head podcast. So needless to say, I'm very excited they're now supporting the show. Gaia truly is my personal go-to source for streaming consciousness content on the web. They have an incredible 7,000 plus exclusive videos covering 5,000 years of wisdom. Just to give you guys an example, on uh, April 24th on the show Buzzsaw, Dennis McKenna, who is the brother of the world's most well-known psychonaut, Terrence McKenna, makes a guest appearance to discuss the spiritual implications and mystical experiences that psychedelic substances can induce. I mean, it'd be pretty hard to be more up my alley, right? And as you all hear me constantly say, it, it's a daily conscious effort to maintain an elevated vibration. And if you're looking to go deep down the rabbit hole to do so, then Gaia is the best place I know of to do it, period. And you can sign up for your first month for only 99 cents at Gaia.com forward slash positive head. That's spelled G-A-I-A dot com forward slash positive head. Check it out. So to switch gears real quick uh, here, Bruce, uh, as and this has been absolutely fascinating. I wish I had uh, another two hours with you, but uh, I know uh, life carries on and, and maybe we can circle back around for another episode down down the line. But what I would like to do, and I don't want to let you get off the hook without sharing a story of synchronicity or uh, serendipity or a positive paranormal uh, story. I'm guessing you probably have something juicy for us. <laughs> There's so many of them, I wish we had another hour or two to talk about them, because <laughs> in retrospect, when I'm so, once I started to understand the nature of the energy, the field, and and, our, and how we are programmed and all that, and to see my life unfold, I realized, oh my God, there are forces acting outside of me that appear to be coincidences if you look at them individually, but when you look at them collectively, it's like, oh my God, there's a, a force causing something to happen here. I mean, it has every effect on me, even where I went to the university, what I did for my research, how the research led to, you know, next thing and how my life has changed. Everyone is one. And, and so I thought, well, here, just two very quick ones, just to show you, but th- th- it's a whole string of them, but I can pull two out very quickly. And one of them is this, is mm-hmm. that um, I used to be a professor at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine. And then my research revealed that what I was teaching medical students about genetics was incorrect. And my research on stem cells said, oh my God, it's a whole different science. And I was like the outsider <laughs> at this moment. Right. Why? Because everybody in the field was so into genes and genetics and human genome project and my work was going well genes are nice but that's not where the control is and so I'm the only guy out there and everybody else is going this way at some point uh, I resigned my position from the university because I realized I'm not teaching what I know to be scientifically valid that was clashing with the conventional thought so I walked out and right. I resigned my position and then I went into my own research uh, doing my own studies uh, trying to understand what I observed in my laboratory experiments that challenged the belief and trying to understand how it worked and uh, I did this for a while and at some point I thought geez you know um, I'd really like to go back into the university situation and then I realized I said to myself because all this stuff was starting to unfold it was providing a whole new understanding of the cell membrane and, and you know consciousness and program oh, this is like really exciting. I thought, I really want to take this in university. So I realized, I said, oh, God, you know, uh, uh, reapplying. I was a professor at a top-ranked university in the uh, in the world, one of the top-ranked universities. Right. And I was like, well, we're, how do you get back in? So I thought, uh, you know what, I'm going to apply to a whole bunch of mediocre schools uh, in a sense that, well, I'll get back in, I'll establish myself. And I applied mm-hmm. to all these schools. And the shock of my life was every one of them was returned with no thank you. 
And mm-hmm. at the end, my last one came in, and I said, oh, my God, I can't even get back into a mediocre school. I put down that letter from the school, and I was just thinking about it. I said, oh, my God. And just as I was thinking about that, the phone rings, and mm-hmm. a friend of mine who was at Stanford Hey, Bruce, come on to Stanford. You know, there's this position that's opening up, and I think you could really, really, uh, you know, be good there. And, and, the, and the joke was, I w- Stanford is like, you know, within the top very few <laughs> universities course. in the whole world. And the fact sure. was, I was not even applying there. And yeah. yet, the university opened it. It called me to come to Stanford. I didn't call Stanford. They called me. And that was like, wow, this was completely, you know, like, you know, not knowing any of this was just so totally amazing about how these thing universe sets up things like that. Uh, uh, Give another quick one. Uh, And and Margaret, my partner and I, um, uh, she was one that actually was the publisher of my book. We did self-publishing. We didn't have any money. It's a little mom and pop operation. We don't have any money. So we could we put all our money in at that time. I think. I think it was like, you know, over $30,000 to get the first printing. Mm -hmm. And you don't get any money back uh, for a year because uh, you have to get to the distributors and then they sell it. And at the end of the year, you get your money. So it's like you put this money out, you don't get anything back. So we put out all this money, but we had no no advertising. So all of a sudden we're sitting there and the books are, are, are getting printed and we realize now what do we do? And yeah. all of a sudden, out of the blue, uh, uh, I get a phone call from Art Bell, which was Coast to Coast show at night, uh, yeah. uh, which had like up to five to 10 million listeners. And yeah. they said, Bruce, we want you on the program. I said, yeah, but my book's not coming out for another month or two. Uh, I won't have it. And how about if you postpone me and let me be on the program then? So yeah, that would be really great. It'd be, you know, five million or more listeners. I could tell sure. them about the book. Uh, and they said, no, we need you right now to fill in a space. So I said, oh, OK. Uh, and I got online. And guess what? Uh, the book sold out before I had a printed copy of it because just from being on that wow. show. Wow. Uh, all the books sold out instantly. And, and I was like, wow. Uh, and then uh, and the, next, uh, the, the, the next one was, again, no advertising, but Amazon uh, was celebrating its 10th anniversary and they had mm-hmm. a, a big article in all of the Sunday newspapers around the country about the 10th yeah. anniversary of Amazon and how it influences self-publishing. Yeah. They sent a photographer over to my house to photograph me with my book. And most of the article wow. was about my book, about how oh, wow. I published it and became a bestseller. And guess what? Then all of a sudden it sold <laughs> again. I, said, yeah. I-, I could not have done these. It-, it came out. The universe was encouraging all this. I didn't seek them. They came to me, and, uh, 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 and the last one, this is just a, a, a one that always blows my mind. My uh, partner, Margaret, in a former relationship, uh, and that was a long time ago, and uh, they had bought some stock in a, uh, a building, like a, a big building complex or something, and over 15 years, they, they, they just never heard from them. Essentially, in the beginning, there was communication, and it got completely out of memory that they even had yeah. this. And yeah. uh, Margaret and I were sitting down because we sold out the first set of books for 30000 We had to raise another 30000 to get another printing, and we just sold yeah. that. And all of a sudden, but it's not a year. And I have no money, and we have no money. We need another printing. And so Margaret, yeah. who does manifestation, I just love it. She has a process, and she does manifestation. She did her manifestation process, which is you know going out and talking to the universe and stuff like that, saying, we, yeah. really, we really need some support here. And within the week, I mean, it's just like, I, I still, <laughs> I can't believe it. Within the week, a letter came from this company that she had forgotten about years before because they never heard from them. Like it could have just been lost and she didn't even have memories. She had any ownership in it. Right. And the letter was a simple letter with about three sentences. And the first sentence is, as, you know, as a former shareholder in this, we want you to know we sold the building, et cetera, or whatever they sold, whatever it was. And the next sentence was, uh, Within the next few days, expect a very large check. Period. Wow. It was wow. Like, huh? 
what was that? You know, it's just like, <laughs> oh, wow. like what that? and I remember because it was a weekend, we couldn't find out what, what it was. So at first we were thinking, well, what, how much could it be? So we came up with 30,000 because that would give us the next printing. Yeah, that yeah. would really, the 30,000 would be really great. That's a big amount Perfect. of money. That'd be really exciting. Yeah. Yeah. So Monday comes and she calls him on the phone. I can't hear the conversation. I can just see Margaret with the phone. And she said, well, how much is this very large check you're talking about? And I watched Margaret, and her jaw drops open, and her eyes just got big, and I couldn't hear yeah. what was going on. <laughs> and, uh, and she said, well, th- thank you, thank you very much, and then put the phone down. And I looked at her and said, oh, well, 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 how much? <laughs> Three three hundred thousand dollars. Oh wow! Well, where did it come from? <laughs> Going out into the universe and saying we need these funds to continue this project to do this work, and and as I was saying, the project seems to be in alignment with the universe. So everywhere along the way, coincidences, yeah. if as individual events. But synchronicities and collectiveness reveal by putting an intention out in the field and doing this in harmony with the planet, the planet was giving back the support to D in harmony with them. And all of this right. was like, it came out of the blue. I mean, Stanford called me. I wouldn't even, never even applied to Stanford. Right, <laughs> right. You, know? you were going for like lower level schools and getting yeah. rejected. Stanford, of course, being the pinnacle, essentially, of, you know, yeah. uh, that whole education system. So, wow, what a, what inspiring stories, Bruce. It's that's such a, 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 such a on, pleasure. You don't have a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I definitely, not only were you one of the first on my list of wish list of interviews, but now you're on my, the top of my wish list for a second interview so I hope to circle back around with you at some point because literally I have a laundry list of questions here that I didn't even get to which is great I'll save them for another day and um, I will leave you with one question though that I like to leave everyone meaning what is the meaning of life according to Bruce Lipton in 60 seconds or less meaning of life is to to create and personally experience heaven and this is where you can do it right here it just have to understand what was in the way. And once you understand that, there is no stopping of that creation. This planet is heaven if you really stop and look how beautiful life is on this planet. Uh, and this is available to all of us. And I want every one of us to experience because the more people that experience the earth as heaven, the more real heaven becomes for all of us. Right. So well said. Thank you so much, Bruce. Um, You're welcome. Yeah, seriously, such a pleasure. And I want to thank you because all of this is connected to what we call positive head. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. (laughs) Such a pleasure, my friend. I look forward to our paths hopefully crossing in person uh, one day. And thank you so much, Bruce. Well, everyone, that concludes this week's interview episode. If you have enjoyed this positive download, please Take a minute, give us a rating or review on iTunes, since iTunes is the holy grail of all things podcasting. Uh, Your good reviews help us to reach more listeners. Also, we would be extremely appreciative if you would tell your friends and family about the show. Our sincere intent with the Positive Head podcast is to spread positivity to the world because, well, because we're selfish, quite honestly. Uh, I say that jokingly, but really only halfway joking. I'm referring to the good kind of selfish based on the knowing that we all get what we give in this life because when we give, we're actually always giving to extensions of self since we're all really one in the same consciousness, just in different bodies. So if you want to be a good selfish along with us by helping to spread the positivity, by all means, please proceed to shout about the Positive Head podcast from your rooftop. (laughs) Otherwise, As you continue on your fabulous journey in this 3D reality, be sure to remember this. As long as you ain't dead, you're already positive ahead. Journey well, everyone, and thank you for being.